Get you out in here. I, this is Todd. I'm unmuting all of the board members on the join and the attorney as well. Thanks, Todd. Jonathan, I've unmuted you. So if you need to mute yourself, you can. I am here. Thank you. So we are missing lots of board members. I know that uh, I know that Mr. Roberts is working right now with Mr. Upland. Okay. We do not have quorum. Okay, do we know the status of the other board members, Todd? I'm trying to. Can you resend? Yes. Well, let's see. I'm going to resend them the link as well. Okay.
Hey Todd, um, so Hillary joined, but she's listed as an attendee, not as a panelist. Yeah, and she dropped out as an attendee, I think, because she's trying to dial back in as a panelist. I'm not aware of a limit on a panelist. Are, uh, are you? This is Todd here. I just want to let you know we're we're still trying to get uh, uh, Dr. H and Matthew Roberts on. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Welcome back. Will? Yes, Matthew, I see you've joined. Okay, I got in. You got a quorum? We have a quorum now. All right, we'll go ahead and get started while uh, we get the other board members. Uh, Todd, uh, do you know the status of the other board members? Right now, but we're working on getting them on. Okay. You've talked. You've actually talked to the rest of the board members just to. Uh, I'm I'm emailing and and texting and they're calling and uh, I got my other guys working with them. I know we're in touch with Hal Kiotis and McKnight. I uh, don't think I've heard from Stephen yet. I, I haven't seen yeah. if she's on yet. Okay. Can I jump in and explain the issue that I had? The I had to actually retype. Uh, email address that it wasn't entered correctly. And once I once that was corrected, uh, Todd, I went in and hit your link. Then it comes up and it's showing the incorrect email address for me. I corrected that, and then it allowed me once I corrected that to sign in. We'll, we'll go ahead and uh, get started since we do have a quorum. Um, Someone's tapping. Very loud. Uh, maybe go on mute. If you're not tapping, please go on mute. All right. 
Um, I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. The Orange County Board of Education pledges to its citizens to conduct its business in a courteous and productive manner, showing respect for fellow board members, staff, and its citizens. The board asks its citizens to conduct themselves in the same courtesy towards both school personnel and each other. As per board's policy, Robert's rule of order will be used to conduct meetings. A moment of silence will be observed before each meeting. In addition to the moment of silence at each meeting held at a school site, the board will recite the Pledge of Allegiance. The board asks that you check your cell phones and other electronic devices to be certain they are either turned off or on vibrate to avoid interruptions of the meeting. Um, with that, we'll start off with our uh, moment of silence. All right, um, first up on our agenda, we have the agenda adoption. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I think it's important that we record the four people who are here. Dr. H is joining. Dr. H, can you hear us? Hi. Dr. Alkiotis, I can hear you. Thank you. All right. Do we have any opposed to the uh, adoption of the agenda? All right. Next, we have the consent agenda. Motion to adopt the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right, motion carries. Uh, the next item on the agenda uh, moves us to policy updates, first reading, uh, policy 5210, distribution and display of non-school materials. Um, do we have uh, presenting that today? I'll do that. This is Jonathan. If that's okay, Dr. Felder. That is fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, this policy was presented to the policy committee. Uh, the policy committee unanimously supported sending it to the full board on first reading. It's your existing policy with some changes recommended by the North Carolina School Boards Association, basically addressing political signs and, and when they can be removed um, after posted. Um, and so it is an update and you can see that, that, the, that the attachment is your existing policy and it, and it just shows the changes in red. Um, that's it. questions from any of the board? Well, I'm using, I'm realizing we don't have that um, raise hand feature here, so I'll just unmute. <laughs> so Jonathan, this is the State School Board Association recommendations, basically verbatim. It, it is. It's your policy. So it's not the exact School Boards Association's policy because you have made some changes in the past it, but it's taking your existing policy and then taking the school boards association verbatim, adding it in, um, and then and um, and then we of course had to change some lettering um, in order to align with the change. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? Motion to approve changes. Second. All in favor. Aye. Opposed? All right. As a reminder, that comes back on second reading on consent. All right. The 
next item uh, is the uh, E-Rate WAN Award. Uh, Todd, I believe this is yours. Todd Jones. Yes. Uh, can you hear me okay? No. Uh, am I just not clear or? That's oh, better. That's better, but a lot of static. Yeah. Sorry, I'm rustling here a little bit. So what you have before you, uh, we have a wide area network services contract that uh, is, is going to expire this year. So uh, as part of our E-rate arrangement, we put it out for uh, uh, what's called a mini bid in, in accordance with the, uh, uh, the state purchasing laws. We got three responses to that mini bid for services. Uh, and uh, of the three respondents, uh, there were uh, one was Spectrum, whom we've used over the years. Uh, we have a lot of familiarity with them. Uh, the other two uh, vendors who submitted a bid were uh, OCSD Velocity Fiber and Segra. Uh, in evaluating these, uh, the rubric that we used, we gave more points for Spectrum because we've had a lot of experience with them and that's been positive experience. Also, if you look at the rubric, the uh, the bid was significantly lower than the uh, the other two bidders, so on the basis of the much lower price and our longstanding relationship with Spectrum, we felt like we, it was a pretty easy uh, recommendation to to renew with Spectrum. Uh, and with that, I'll open the floor for any questions. Well, just one quick question: Did the other two vendors do anything? to improve our rural internet access? To my knowledge, the other two vendors have no physical infrastructure. Okay, so they, they weren't going to do anything based on what you know to improve access over what Spectrum's providing? No. Okay. That's all I've got. Okay. Any other question from any other board member? So, so Todd, I do have some questions. Uh, okay. Thanks for not getting them to you earlier. Um, I noticed that there. Uh, one of the first questions I have is uh, the 1010 um, address, which is the um, after school. I noticed that they're still on there, but they moved to the welcome center. Uh, is there a reason we're still providing internet there? Is there anybody in that facility? Not currently, but I understand there may be, and we can suspend service, but this is more of a broad base, uh, making sure that we've got all the potential buildings covered. Okay, okay. Um, okay, it's just setting the baseline of the, the price. Okay, I get that. Yes, um, exactly. So I, I noticed in the contract, there's a big variance on the cost. And uh, for example, there's five, seven, uh, five, uh, or 785 per month and 500 per month um, on some of them where 500 per month gives you 500 megabytes, uh, but there are other $500 a month that gives us one terabyte or two terabytes for the same price. Uh, I'm curious why we're not able to get the two terabytes for the 500 a month versus this uh, big price difference, it looks like it costs. I mean, the, the two gigabytes? Yeah, there was, uh, yeah, two gigs, I'm sorry. The one gig and two gigs, you're right. I have a typo on my notes here. Um, yeah, instead of uh, the, uh, I saw that there's a big price or speed difference. Most of, there's several that are 500 meg, but then there are some that we're paying the same amount for. We're getting uh, one gigabyte or two gigabytes. Uh, I'm curious why we're not able to get the two terabytes for the 500 mag for all of the sites. Uh, presumably, it has something to do with kind of the, the, the distance from some of their aggregation equipment. I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, that's generally been their pricing model that we've seen over the years. So, the, so you're talking about the last mile kind of issue? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. I mean, I, I don't have any other other concerns other than uh, 
uh, just the price deltas, uh, but this is essential for keeping our schools online. Uh, and as, as I may have mentioned in the financial impact, state has historically paid the remaining 40%. They've committed that for the next year, which would be the first year of this three year contract. Uh, they do commit that on a, an ongoing basis year by year. So we can't just assume that they will cover it for year two and three, but that's been historically what they've done over the years. All right. Any other questions from anybody? I think Jonathan has a question. All right, Jonathan. Um, Todd, would it be okay if it would it present any problems if the board, if it's so inclined to approve this um, item to make it subject to legal review, just so that we can just double check with you to make sure that we've got uh, the contract in place with all of the necessary protections? Well, I think that the original deadline is really breathing down our necks. I think it was originally Wednesday. Uh, I think there's some talk of forgiveness under the circumstances, but I've been out for medical reasons and it took a while to get this in shape with all of our E-rate folks. So I don't, I don't know if, if we would be uh, remiss with a deadline and pushing it further. I guess what I would suggest maybe if that's the case, then it, that we could get, um, that I could expedite just to make sure that there's um, nothing significant in the way of a concern that you could get it to me and um, we could give it a, a quick look. I mean, we're obviously not going to do a legal review that forfeits your chances of getting a, a good contract, but I think it would make sense for us to give it a look. Sure. So it's it's in uh, it's one of the attachments in assembly. Do you want me to send you a separate copy? So is that the entire um, contract, Todd? Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, so I do see that there's a link that talks about uh spectrum enterprise commercial terms of service and there's a link there so i think there's an additional terms that are at the end that and, and that's often the case that they'll link you to some general terms i just just want to make sure that that, that uh it's going to be a light review but just to make sure that it's it's legal and that there's uh no significant concerns and i'll, I'll get somebody on it immediately thanks all right any I, other I, I would suggest if, if that's okay that the board approve it subject to legal review. I'll make that motion unless we have other questions. Yes. Okay, uh, so we have a uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion carries. All right, the next item on our agenda is the uh, public hearing on the superintendent's recommended uh, budget. So, Dr. Felder. Good evening, Mr. Atherton. This is Rhonda. If I may, um, Dr. Felder, do you just want me to go ahead and start? Sure. If I may, I would like to share. I would like to share my screen with you. If um, Mr. Jones, if you could provide me that access, please. There we go. Okay, Ron. Uh, one. Okay, now I see it now. Okay. Okay. Just a few updates since we presented our budget to you guys at our last board meeting. A few things that I would like to point out is, first of all, DPI did release our projected enrollment numbers. And for fiscal year uh, 21, that comes in at 7,381. Um, that was our only change in regards to our ADM since we last spoke. If you recall, for our continuation budget, we were factoring in um, state increases at 5% for certified staff and 2.5% for classified staff. That brings our total continuation budget to $36.7 million. 
or an additional $148 per pupil that will be needed just to fund continuation. At our last meeting, we recommended several expansion items, and since that time, we have included a few other items that we would like for you to consider. The first item uh, that we have added for a recommendation is to reinstate all of the teacher assistant work days. If you recall, back in fiscal year 2019, in order to balance the budget, one of the ways that we elected to reduce some expenditures and save positions was to um, no longer pay teacher assistants for work days and no longer permit them to work. This last fiscal year, we reinstated five of those work days at the beginning of the year. And this year, based upon um, feedback that we have received, we would like to recommend reinstating all four, it would be nine days that we would reinstate in this budget cycle, which would reinstate all 14 teacher assistant work days. The next item that we would like to recommend for consideration is additional support at Gravely Hill Middle School. We know that um, this school doesn't qualify for two assistant principals based upon the student counts as our other middle schools do. However, we do have a program there that requires a lot of administration time supporting student behaviors, the MAP program. And as we look at transitioning students back into the traditional setting, it takes a lot of administrative time to be involved. We would like to recommend for consideration a behavior liaison a position that would be at Gravely Hill School that would support um, those students as well as um, all of the students at that school location. Okay, Finally, Will, Rhonda, do you all, uh, on, I have several questions on s some of these. Do we want to do them by line item or after we go through each one of them? It's just a question. Um, um, let's let let's let Rhonda go through the whole, all of them, and then let's go talk through uh, whichever ones we have, uh, just so she can give us a complete picture. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the. Final item that I wanted to address as an addition for a recommended consideration this evening is two additional school counselors. These would be um, counselors that would be split between multiple schools. Um, primarily, we're thinking uh, to better support our middle school students. Um, these positions, they would be more of roving, but they would actually be in the schools directly supporting the students in the school locations. And um, I was not planning to go through the other items that we brought to you for recommendations at our previous meeting. I'm happy to if you would like for me to touch on those again. However, I just wanted to point out the additions that we had to the superintendent's recommended budget, which now brings us to an increase per pupil of roughly $308. $160 per pupil would be needed to fund these expansion requests, but overall we're looking at a total increase of $308. Okay, does anybody need uh, Rhonda to go through the prior details? All right, with that, uh, Matthew, you can go ahead. Okay, I, I'm gonna start with the Gravely Hill additional support. Rhonda, when you, you mentioned transition. Is this transition from year round? School to a traditional school calendar that is the issue? Um, no, this is in support of middle school students. So it is actually transitioning these 
students who are um, in the MAP program back into their traditional classroom setting. Bear, bear with me. I'm, I got to get so refresh my memory. Do our other middle schools have MAP students also? Um, I'm going to I'm going to ask my colleague to um, be unmuted so that they can assist me in answering your questions. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. This is Connie Crimmins. Rhonda, would you like me to um, jump in here? I would love for you to. So the middle school alternative program um, was about four to five years ago, and this was for students who's, um, who are primary, who are identified under students with disabilities and their behavior is such that they are unable to access their education within the general education program. The goal of the middle school alternative program is to provide a therapeutic environment while they are learning behavioral skills, their academic needs are met with the ultimate goal of the supports within that smaller classroom being able to eventually transition into the general, pop, um, general education um, resource or general ed setting in their typical with their typical developing peers and be able to then access high school as a typical student. Okay, and so they would be uh, direct reporting to the principal at that school. Yes, uh, the additional support. So, to additional uh, and support. So, yes, it's also important to note that the middle school alternative program. Um, does serve students from the other uh, middle schools. There is a criteria for movement over there. It's not um, just they're exhibiting behaviors, but there's a whole criteria of um, things that uh, supports that the other schools must put in place before we make this move over to Gravely Hill. Currently, there is a part-time behavior liaison, and with the needs of the children in that um, classroom, a full-time behavior liaison would help tremendously in um, helping those students overcome their mental health challenges. And Dr. Fielder, if I understood uh, correctly, they would be reporting to the principal? Yes. Okay. The next the one. I'm sorry, it's, it's one position okay. uh, reporting to the one principal, um, and that is the principal at Gravely Hill. Okay. The next one that I have a question about is our two additional school counselors. Where do we expect the majority of their time spent? Uh, so the majority of their time would be spent um, in the, at the secondary level, uh, primarily at um, middle schools supporting um, students directly mm -hmm. and those positions would be again reporting to principals at um at, at those schools again okay. the, seeing how that is, is how many are we looking at one or two additional we are requesting two additional, two additional. So which middle schools would they be reporting to uh, they would be roving and so they would divide their time uh, between uh, the the three schools, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, and they would have uh, the the two counselors would have a direct reporting to the three principals at those schools. Yes, and the three principals would be responsible for um, uh, the counselors' uh, evaluation. So they share that evaluation, but. These positions would provide direct support to students, have direct contact with students, uh, support with uh, individual student planning, um, responsive services, et cetera. And I'm going to ask um, Ms. Cobbs, I believe she is on. Sharita Cobb, if you want to add additional uh, information. Yes. Um counselors would report directly to the principals in that school and they would also um, provide support around social emotional learning 
um, throughout the, the middle school area for those um, counselors and teachers in those buildings. They would also um, help with behavior management support and the development of small group and individualized um, therapy sessions at those schools um, and the counseling needs of students. And they would also help with career and academic planning and support not just students, but families in understanding uh, what career and academic planning looks like and um, help prepare students to move to the next level. Okay. Now, Sheree, you, you said both schools, but I'm, is it two, two of our middle schools or all three middle schools? It's all three. All three. And, yes. Uh, and it, it will be a very strong reporting line to the principals on these counselors. Yes. Okay. Uh, Pre-K dual language at New Hope. That's not, I, I know that it's going to cost additional money because we'll have to uh, hire a bilingual staff for that. But that really is not expanding our pre-K. Is that a fair statement? That's correct. It's not expanding pre-K. Okay. Uh, I still want to have a challenge on that knowing that we have uh, county commissioners who are receptive to us expanding our pre-K, I would like to see an expansion request uh, uh, and finding uh, a location, maybe it's central or uh, one of our other elementary schools where we can truly increase the number of enrolled students in our pre-K. I'm in support of the dual language but I also think that we need to expand our pre-K on that. That's the only comment I've got on that. Uh, the uh, equity uh, facilitators, we're adding three on that. And I, I re was really impressed when the comment was made that they would be teaching an honors class uh, at our high schools on that. Are two of them actually will one this will, will one of these be a direct report to Orange High and another one a direct report to Cedar Ridge with a dotted line to Dr. Keeling? So my guess would be that um, because they're teaching that that would be under the principles to do those evaluations. I'm not just talking about the teaching part of it. That would, would I know it that right now you're a, a department of one, right? And, and and you need some assistance, and and your the equity facilitators are going to need assistance also. But I, speaking as one board member, would hope that two of them would be a, a direct report to Cedar Ridge one at Cedar Ridge and one at Orange High with a dotted line to you so that not only are they teaching the courses, but the principals uh, have uh, in, uh, a, a, a better uh, communication with them. It's just a, something to think about. The last one I have a question about is our four maintenance techs. Those are going to be district-wide, is that correct? Yes, sir. Those are going to be district wide. Okay. Well, that's the only ones that I have questions on, but I do uh, I'm the pushing to expand our pre K if we have capacity at one of our elementary schools and to put it in there and ask for it. And then uh, these other getting under the direct control of the principals, I'm in strong support of that. That's all I've got. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, other board members, questions, comments on this? This is Sarah. I just have a, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. The, just a comment on the Gravelly Hill Middle School Additional Support for the MAP program. Um, at a, if we could mute the lines, I think that would help with the feedback. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, at our last Student Achievement Committee meeting, um, uh, the principal, Ms. Ruhak, spoke um, more about that program and um, and about the amount of time that she ended up um, sort of playing this sort of um, behavioral support additional role herself. Um, and so 
something that's really appealing to me about this is giving that additional support really allows her to spend her time then on the whole school. Um, so I'm glad to see this addition. All right, other comments? I have a comment. Go ahead, Brenda. All right, <clears throat> my comment is um, after I heard Matthew mention uh, perhaps adding something to the expansion, my uh, memory went back to last year's budget and uh, we talked about uh, recruitment and retention and we said that our benefits package would be one that <clears throat> would be helpful for recruitment and retention and we talked about paternity leave. So I'm just, I wanna say if we start pulling other things to go into the expansion, I would like to remind us that, you know, we were big on that last year, but uh, we, we're not talking about that this year. So I think Hillary put that on the table last year. Yeah, and, and Brenda, I agree with you. I think there's strong board support for that and a couple yeah. of others as well. Do you provide me direction on what those uh, areas are for strong support that you may be looking to want in your budget? Yeah, so I, I will call these out and I will ask the board to uh, tell me if there's concerns with these. These are just the ones that have been talked about at uh, our joint meeting with the um, Chapel Hill and also discussed in other board meetings. So as uh, Ms. Stevens mentioned, um, the maternity leave being one of the expansion items, uh, the dental, medical um, mm -hmm. subsidies for those. And then the last one I had was the uh, two incremental uh, weather days for um, our uh, um, certified staff. Mm -hmm. That's, um, I think that last bit was for classified staff. I, really yeah, I wrote it down. Yeah. yeah. Classified. So those were the ones that I had originally that the board talked about expansion. If anybody is is is, a, is feels strongly about one of those not being on or or on or changes, uh, those were the ones that I had written down originally from the original discussion. Right. Any other comments from any other board members? Um, one other comment I have on this, and it's the same comment I've had for every time this comes up, I, I would like the board to uh, support going forward with a one-time bonus to teachers and staff that did not get a bonus, uh, you know, and a specific line item to uh, the county commissioners on that to um, uh, to do a one-time bonus since we weren't able to they weren't able to get raises last year and it's questionable this year I'd like to see if there is something uh, we could do uh, to support them especially given you know what what we're having to figure out right now as well uh, will yes uh, along that line uh, I think we need to have a discussion about having bonuses for our Title I elementary schools. So I, I'm going to ask you to say a little more on that, Matthew. Um, the Wake County has recognized that there's a challenge at our Title I schools, Title I schools, and retaining teachers at our Title I schools that uh, I think that one, we need to retain experienced teachers there, and we need to have an incentive for our staff to want to work at our Title I schools. I guess 
I could just um, respond to that. I think my question is whether that's a problem that we have or not retaining and attracting staff to our Title I schools. Um, we don't, nobody needs to answer that right now. That's just, that would be, that would be part of my consideration in whether or not we should consider it. Sarah, actually, I think it will be great for staff to present our turnover at each elementary school. Are there any other? Uh, May I ask clarity, please? Yes, go ahead. Is the request for staff turnover at each elementary school or just Title One schools? I think, it, from my viewpoint, uh, I think it would be important that we see the longevity at each of our elementary schools because longevity does affect amount of funding that goes into that elementary school because our more experienced teachers tend to earn more than our younger teachers so it can skew the amount of funding per student at our elementary schools because some of our uh, elementary schools may have younger staff and it could be that there are title one schools i could be wrong Just a thought on that. Um, I, I think Matthew's point is an interesting one and um, it relates to the ESSA reporting. Um, Ms. Rath, you'll know about this, about um, school level spending. And I think it is important for us as a board to understand what the school level spending is. And um, at some point, I think the state of North Carolina will be reporting on that. And so everyone will, will understand our school level funding. Um, I feel like that starts to get into a much bigger issue than this one around bonuses. And so um, I do think to, to understand whether we have a problem of turnover um, and attracting um, effective staff to Title I schools, we probably would want not just to know what is the turnover at our Title I schools, but the other schools too, because so you have, you have a point of comparison. Um, oh, yeah. so Sarah, I agree with that. And your point about the, the first student spending at each of the schools, that is a big issue. That it, it, is there a difference in per student spending at our schools? And if there is, what's causing it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Are there any other expansion items that? Uh, any of the board members would like to discuss uh, for addition or for current expansion items? I have a question, which is whether we know what Apple Hills um, schools are um, looking at doing, what their request might be. So Ms. Rath or Ms. Cunningham Brown, can you speak to that, please? this time, I um, am unaware of exactly what Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools is going in with, but I will get that information. Just curious. Thank you. If I could interject, Will, this is Jonathan. Just, just at the high level, it's my understanding that this is not here on an action item tonight. It's the public hearing, and I know before we close, you'll just confirm that no, nobody in the public has signed up for this, so we can have that in minutes. Uh, but in terms of tonight, I do think it would be helpful for some of the items that have come up if, if Will, you're able to sort of ascertain whether there's a consensus on the board for the administration to add an item um, or not. Because, you know, obviously the administration's looking to figure out what budget to bring you as an action item at the next meeting. So I think it would be helpful to determine whether there is any sort of majority to add anything particularly or to keep what has been recommended, but perhaps ask staff to just bring some information. Thank you. All right, Jonathan. Um, and well, before we do that, I guess, just a clarifying question I would have before I have a strong opinion on that is whether um, Dr. Felder, um, the additional things that the board brought up tonight, so around maternity leave and the extra weather days and those things, 
whether those were things um, that your team considered, looked at the cost of, and decided that these things in your view were more important, or whether, um, and sort of whether that was already part of what you were factoring in here. Yes, we certainly uh, did look at those things and we do think they are uh, important um, and certainly can add uh, with want some guidance from the board with regards to um, what items you all think are important from the list that was discussed in, in the joint meeting. So they're all important. We just know that uh, we cannot put all of it on uh, or include it all in the budgets. If there were ones that um, the board felt were um, important to include, we would do that. And Sarah, just as a side note, once we know what Chapel Hill is asking for, then we'll have a gauge of, you know, what's realistic to work with as well. As you know, we can't, we, we both can't go in with uh, one being a high number, one a low number. It's it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Let me just uh, uh, before we go on, see if uh, Tony or uh, Dr. Hal Kiotis, uh have. Uh, anything to add or Hillary, just to give you all a chance to, to add anything. Got a question. Go ahead, Dr. H. The funding for the director of literacy. Refresh my memory when we abandoned that position at the request of the prior superintendent. Two years ago, where did the funding go at that particular time? The duties were assigned to other people. Where, what happened to the funding for that position? The funding was shifted to support other initiatives in the district. Okay, so for all practical purposes, the position and the, and the funding for that position disappeared. Um, I don't want to say disappeared. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying it, to be polite. Yeah, no, the funding was, it was just, it was shifted to um, the overall general budget as a result of the position being frozen. So, see, that's the problem I, I have is that uh, I'm wondering where that money ended up going because now we're refunding a position that's been funded before, but the monies were dissipated to other programs. Um, I, I understand your question and I can take a deep dive and try to specifically identify where those funds were actually shifted if that's what you're asking. Yeah, it is, and it's not necessary to do that tonight, but I think for the sake of being transparent and totally clear, uh, money was there for this position. The person left, the former superintendent didn't want to fill that position for whatever reason, and now we find ourselves requesting to fund it again. So I, I just think in order for everybody to understand it, we just need some further clarification, not necessarily tonight. I understand, um, Dr. H, and I really appreciate you asking the questions because in all essence, we do have 100% transparent. And I will go back and review um, to see for some reason I am thinking um, that those funds may have, I just need to look because it may have been used, we may have actually decreased the um, total budget to be able to balance the budget. Yeah, see, that's why I, I think it's important just to take another look at that, figure out exactly where it went, but I, I appreciate it. Uh, yes, that's thank my you. only comment, and uh, it's going to be an ambitious budget, to say the least. <laughs> All right, uh, Hillary or Tony, do you have any additional comments or questions? Mm -hmm. Uh, 
So for my clarity, since um, we don't have any further comments, the budget that you want to see brought back before you for your approval would be the items that are included here, as well as maternity leave, dental and medical subsidies, the two inclement weather days, as well as um, I, is there consensus with the whole board regarding increasing uh, pre-K enrollment, as well as the one-time bonus for, I have some questions, clarity questions in regards to the one-time bonus for teachers and staff as well. I'm trying to get clarity on what is the consensus of the full board for your budget. And I, I would just suggest, this is Jonathan, that you just go one by one, if you could, Will, um, and just see is there consensus, you know, for this item, and, and then Rhonda will know to price it and add it and just um, and go in that fashion, if that's okay. No, it's it's fine. Uh, we I, I think we covered it at the beginning, but I'll, I'll go through it again just to give everybody a, a chance. Um, so is there any... Uh, dissension or concern with the maternity leave being added for consideration. Uh, the subsidy for dental. Subsidy for medical. The two incremental uh, weather days for classified. Uh, next one I have is um, asking for a one-time bonus to teachers and staff uh, that did not get a bonus uh, as a one-time uh, event from the, the county level. Do you mean, when you say staff who didn't get a bonus, do you mean staff didn't get a raise? And so, because some staff did get bonuses because of their excellent teaching and student growth, and I wouldn't want them not to get the bonus. So I just want to clarify what you mean. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I shouldn't have said uh, bonus, uh, a raise. So some staff, uh, some teachers did get a bonus, but it was a very unique situation um, that did get a bonus. So it was a very small amount of teachers that did get a bonus. So it would be anybody outside of that. And then I would I would oppose that because I think if we're going to give teachers a raise, I would not want to leave out the subset of teachers who got a bonus for excellent teaching. Yeah, no, 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 no. So I I, I don't mean bonuses at all. I mean raises. So uh, there was a ra incremental raise. I think it was um, a certain level that that got a a incremental raise that didn't go across the spectrum of teachers. Rhonda, do you have the details on that? Yes, I was gonna step in. Um, I, uh, Ms. Smiley, there was a group, the legislators, the salary schedule that they did approve for a certain group, um, primarily when you went, um, it was year 15 to roughly year 20 their salaries went up $1,000, their annual salary did. So if you fell in that band for your years of service, your salary did increase $1,000 annually for this uh, year. That was the only population, uh, they refer to it as the, the bump increase, that was the only population that received any salary increases this fiscal year. And that is because they didn't pass a budget. That's why no one else got a salary increase. That is correct. Yeah, so this this would not, this is not about bonuses at all. And it, it what I meant was everybody that didn't get a salary increase, they would get a bonus. So if you're getting bonuses for other reasons, that that's ignored in this. My clarifying question, if I may, sure. sent out some numbers um, to the full board regarding uh, 
certain levels for this one time bonus. I will just need some feedback on what we would like to request the one time bonus to be. Okay, so, so Rhonda, just to try to be transparent with everybody that's here, um, I think the two options you gave were uh, the full district and not the full district, right? Teachers and versus the full staff, correct? Uh, the, the scenarios that I gave, yes, were full-time staff that did not include um, drivers and child nutrition assistants. And then I gave you the numbers that included uh, that population as well. Full staff, full-time, full-time, full-time equivalent staff as well as those two populations. Um, just comment on this item, which is the numbers that Rhonda sent us in either case came out around a million dollars. Like they were different, but they were ballpark around a million dollars. And this entire, entire expansion request is 1.3. And so I think I um, I think this is already really ambitious. What is even on the screen right now? Never mind adding um, even other things. And so um, I'm not inclined to support that one. Unfortunately, I just don't think we'll get it. Um, I mean, we I don't know, I mean, or we can just like ask for everything. I don't know. We we can ask, and they can say no. Nope, we can't do that. That that's why I prefer to ask them and them say no. Than to not ask um, because you're right. Uh, once we find out, you know, uh, Chapel Hill's funding level as well, we'll we'll know what our what our delta will be from a request standpoint. That will not indicate what we actually get in funding. Uh, but I, I'd hate to not ask, especially given you know everything that's going on and the challenges we have now and the challenges we'll have, you know, going forward, especially given the uh, economy impact we're, we're about to be in. Will. Dr. Akiotis, go ahead. Are you asking for a special side request to the commissioners and this bonus not being part of the regular school budget request? Exactly. Just like we went in with uh, an equity request, I, I will reach out as well if the board uh, is in favor to ask um, if Chapel Hill wants to do this as a district to say, we would like as a district to line item this one, just like we did uh, before. And if they say no, you know, we have, you know, attempted to at least bring this forward and uh, have it considered. But yes, I'm not, I'm not wanting to divide it into this at all. I, I would like it as a separate item. I'm supportive of it if it's a separate item. I'm yes. not supportive of it if you tack it on to the existing uh, budget request that's going forward. I do not want it included in here for the exact reason everybody else is. I don't want us to, to go in with this, you know, huge amount Vicious. of that's over. Yeah, that's over that, that just makes this even greater, but it's as a separate line item and request. Sounds good. Right. Sarah, would Thank you, you for that clarity. Us? Sarah, are you okay with that? Oh yeah, as a separate item, especially if um, Carborough Chapel Hill also is the same thing. Okay, any other board members concerned with, with that item as a separate line item? It sounds good as a separate item. Yeah. All right, the last item, uh, well, I have two more items, I should say. Um, the, uh, just making a note here. Um, so the, the next one I have was expansion of pre-K. Okay. Comments? Well, on that one, since we were able to identify roughly a million dollars for the one-time line item, uh, and I know this may be hard and it's going to depend on how many classrooms we could find space for, but what's 
would our cost be if we decided we wanted to add two pre-K classrooms to get away from having our waiting list? I recall the numbers that we had looked at when we were looking at this before, and any of my colleagues need to correct me, please feel free to. I'm calling recalling a number around 209,000 per classroom that did not include um, in mortar. Right. right. Rhonda yeah. said that last part and what? Yes, sir. Um, it was two hundred and nine thousand dollars per classroom, as long that didn't include any capital. As long as we did not have to um, the, use an existing structure. Yes. yes. Right. If I could just interject, and and Rhonda, please uh, correct me if I am uh, incorrect. But that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars was largely for st to staff the classroom, right? Mm -hmm. That was for that is correct. Sure. the staffing and the supplies right. and those items to get right. those classrooms up and running. Right. And so I don't know if Sarah can provide any estimate on what it would cost, but we know that a room to, in order to have pre-K, the room has to meet certain requirements. And I don't, my understanding is, and I could be wrong, uh, but my understanding is that we don't currently have any available rooms uh, that meet the the um, uh, the requirements in terms of um, toileting and sink level and having an exit door, et cetera. Uh, Ms. Pitts, I don't know if you want to speak to that as well, but that's my current understanding. Yes, Dr. Felder, you're accurate in your assessment. It would all depend on the number of classrooms in the building that we were attempting to put those classrooms in and then whether or not it would require students to be pushed out to mobile units. Okay, now, still two questions. One, I know the staffing, but a lot of these staff fees would be reimbursed if the child qualified for funding, if the state gave us additional funding. Potentially. Right. The second one is that I, I know we have some elementary schools that we would have to force them out into mobile classrooms. But we also have two elementary schools that are not at capacity. Thanks. Uh, so now Central is one and uh, Pathways. And pathways may not be the case anymore because of EC, but can we identify two classrooms with minimal cost on our brick and mortar? And then if we have the demand to fill it and the state give us the funds, we're prepared to take our waiting list down. Calorie, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so my concern with that, I mean, I'm all for expanding pre-K in theory. I have some concern about trying to do it now before we redistrict when we have some schools that are so over capacity and we have no idea when we'll get funding for a new elementary school. I just don't want to do, I don't want to make any decisions that are going to jeopardize our core business and our ability to educate K through five in our elementary buildings into the future as we have all this exponential growth. We know we don't have funding for a new school right now. I just, um, that's a concern I have with moving forward to expand right this minute. Are there others that feel this way? Um, I'd also add that I, I really wanna see us get the wait list down and I don't know that this is the right moment to like go um, full force into adding these classrooms right and, and this is i agree with um hillary and sarah okay tony dr h we'll i think it would be good i think it would be good to put some kind of 
contingency funding in place to be able to, to do something with expansion of pre-K, not necessarily quickly or within the fall semester of your next school year, and who knows what that's going to be. But to have some available funding, for example, if you wanted to look at after you did your redistricting study, to be able to look at uh, how you could rearrange some things. Uh, to me, the most likely candidate would be Pathways because that place was built with bathrooms, age appropriate uh, bath facilities in each classroom, exterior doors, et cetera. So there's a lot of opportunities up there, but you would have to rearrange some populations. So Dr. H, is your, is your view to, to look at this in the future versus trying to put it into the, the current budget? I think right now it's going to be awfully difficult to move ahead on that. You're asking for a pretty huge amount of money. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to say to you, having been through this for a number of years, I wish you the best. Uh, uh, but I'm not even cautiously optimistic that you're going to be able to accomplish all of this stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. Once we get the final numbers, I think we're going to have to make some decisions. Uh, Tony? I'm sorry, was that for me? No, uh, Tony McKnight, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Tony McKnight, how do you feel about the pre-K? Do you, do you feel like we should have it in the current budget or a future budget? I think the pre-K you know, could be in a future budget. I think we've got a long list right now. Um, you know, and, and like Steve said, you know, uh, we're asking for a lot and hopefully we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get what we, we need here, but uh, this is a large list. Okay. So with that, uh, the majority of the board is on the uh, view of pushing this out as a future item, not within the current budget. Um, the, the next item I have is... Uh, Bonuses for Title I elementary retention. Um, just go go around. Uh, is there support for this this time or future? Well, I'm in support of it now. Okay. okay Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd need more evidence that that is the problem and a lot more information. So right now I don't feel like it's ready, but I'm interested in the idea if we come back to it. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, Brenda? Yeah, I agree. It's a good idea, but I don't think we have all of our um, players. We don't, we, don't, we don't have all of our information at this point to, to uh, make that decision. Okay, uh, let's see, Hillary? Uh, I'm the same. I'm interested in it, but um, probably not for right now. Okay. Dr. H? What was the, the, the money number on this? Was this the million plus number? Uh, we don't know what it is. Uh, well, I, I can't. I'm not going to make a, a judgment statement on something. I don't know what it's going to cost. That's well, difficult. The, right. No, the, the question is, Dr. H, is would you be in support of the staff going investigating this to go find out what the, the numbers would be to do this. Uh, since there's a lot going on, uh, just to give staff direction, is this something we want to go have them go investigate at this point? No, I don't know how much would be involved in the investigation. Uh, you know, earlier in the discussion, and I don't want to prolong this, you used the word bonus. When you took the word bonus back, you said raise. Then Rhonda used the word bonus, and then I ended up getting confused. So I'm not clear. Uh, this is strictly for Title I teachers. Is that what you're talking about? No. So so this, uh, uh, Matthew Roberts had requested that uh, we consider doing bonuses for Title I elementary as retention uh, in Title I schools and staff. So this, this concept, I, I you know, I, I apologize if I get this wrong, Matthew, please correct me. It would be Listen. looking at the results of the, how the Title I school does for the year. And this has nothing to do with what I recommended before. 
Dr. H, this would be a new thing that at the end of the school year, if uh, the, the Title I school does well, then those teachers and staff would get a bonus based on uh, the results. Is that oh, okay? So you're talking incentive bonuses here. Yes. yes. Okay. Did I get that right, Matthew? Yes, to a certain degree. That this, my personal opinion is that once the evaluation that we look at it as a board and see our per student spending at each one of our elementary schools. I honestly believe that we're going to find that some of our Title I schools per student spending is less than some of our other other schools. And as a, and part of it is because of the age of the staff at our other elementary schools. And I think we have to have an incentive, whether it's on performance or a recruitment re-signing bonus to say, if you'll hire on at one of our Title schools, one schools will pay you more. And I think we need an incentive at our Title I schools to recruit and retain our teachers. And if our non Title I schools per student spending is more than our Title I schools and it's based on the age of our teacher staff, in my opinion, that means that we're having turnover at our Title I schools. And I'm saying that we need to have a bonus for our Title I schools. And if and I don't have it in front of me, but I th think that we, sh uh, Rhonda uh, shared with me our per student spending at each of our elementary schools. And some of our Title I schools are getting less per student than some of our non-Title I schools. Rhonda, do you have that in front of you? Yes, sir, Mr. Roberts. Um, I, I do, since I am sharing my screen with the budget, I didn't want to click off and go um, hunting on my computer for that because- I haven't clicked my... off either, so I understand that. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I'm sharing my screen with you, so that's why I have not done that. And yes, sir, um, we have provided that and we have talked about it. And I just um, want to, uh, you have alluded to this uh, multiple times in your conversations tonight, that um, some of those per pupil will be impacted based upon the um, tenure of the staff at those schools. So in some cases, those numbers will look or will vary in that regards as a result of um, more tenured staff being at one school location versus another. Because as you have so accurately stated um, earlier this evening, they have higher salaries. Which means they, haven't, they don't have the turnover as some of our other schools. Or they have young, our, some of our Title I schools apparently have younger staff, which is affecting the amount of dollars that we're spending per student at our Title I schools. And, and what I was stating is that sometimes the Title I schools may also have high, I understand what you're saying, and I, I guess what I'm hesitant about is not always is that a good indicator of turnover because you could have, um, I guess I just hate to draw conclusions that schools that have younger teachers also have higher turnover. I, I'm not quite sure I want to conclusively. I, I can, I can accept, that. I can accept that, but it is a fair statement that we have a Title I school that's getting less per student spending than a non-Title I school. Based upon the per pupil numbers that we have looked at, that can be a correct statement, yes. Okay. So I'm gonna leave it at that. All right, so, so Dr. H, uh, <laughs> back to you. <laughs> yeah, well, this is what I have to say about that. I understand, I think I understand what Matthew's saying. Uh, I, 
I think I would suggest, and I'll be gone in a couple of months, but I would suggest this is a, a fruitful area for Dr. Felder to convene an in-house investigation and take a look at this whole topic. Because if you're trying to incentivize and motivate people to do something at Title I levels, you know, four, we got four Title I schools now. They're the majority of the elementary schools. Uh, if you're really trying to incentivize them and to do and, and to look specifically at what the per pupil funding is in each of those school sites. I think that's a that's an interesting study that the superintendent, I would fully entrust Dr. Felder to take on that responsibility. Maybe consider putting a contingency item in the budget of seventy five thousand dollars, fifty thousand or seventy five thousand dollars pending the outcome of Dr. Felder's findings. So H, may I ask clarifying, when you say contingency, are you um, referring to fund balance appropriations or a line item in our request to the county? That would be something that, that you and the superintendent, in my opinion, would sit down and talk about and present it to the whole board uh, when you do this, uh, because uh, these are unusual times. You know, the governor now says May 15th. We may not be going back at all this year. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen since I've been alive. Uh, so I'm just saying, almost like we approach the whole issue with universal breakfast, you could almost do the same thing with this, put some money aside. Uh, you could take it out of fund balance if you want, if the study came back and showed there was a need to do this. Rhonda, if I could interject, this is Jonathan. The, the teachers at the Title I schools are on the same salary schedule as all the other teachers in the district. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. This is just a request to um, pay them more than the teachers at other schools to have incentives for teachers to work there. Is that what you're saying, Mr. Roberts? It is that based on the uh, December, they did something similar in Wake County. We're focusing on what Orange County's doing. Uh, Wake County stepped out and said that, hey, we've got a problem in our Title I schools and we're gonna put additional resources in there. And in theory, our Title I schools should already have additional resources. Yet when I look at per student spending, I'm having a hard time fully understanding other than the fact that our uh, non-Title I elementary schools may have more experienced staff and they're getting paid more than our Title I schools. Does it make sense for the district to first determine whether there is a recruiting or retention problem for teachers in your Title I schools here in Orange? Uh, before putting a budget item on there, it's up to the board, I recognize, I'm just putting a point out there. So Jonathan, let, just give me a minute to finish out the board because it, it's looking like the request is to look at this in the future based on the majority of the board. But let me just get Tony's comments. Thank you. Uh, Tony? <clears throat> so, well, <clears throat> it, it sounds like a good idea, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much going along with the rest of the board in regards to, uh, I don't think it's feasible at this time. Okay. So with that, uh, this would be a request for uh, looking at this and investigating the future, but not for the current budget item. All right, uh, with that, um, that is all the items of expansion that I have. Uh, does any board member uh, have any item that I missed before we continue? Well, this is Jonathan again, um, and I'll, I'll obviously stop if any board member has um, more comments. I, just going back to the the bonus that would be in place that the board um, by consensus agreed to make it a separate item apart from the budget. Um, that that obviously that needs to be rounded out in terms of who gets it and how much. And so that would just come as an additional separate agenda item for the board to explore and decide on at a later date, right? It would have to be submitted as part of what we give to the county. 
So we would just need to have that as part of our next meeting and, um, you know, uh, agree to move forward with it if the board feels comfortable with it. I mean, it's, okay. Good. It, has to, it has to be part of the budget that we submit. We can't come later and say, oh, yeah, this one too. <laughs> I, I just all I'm saying is that it, it just it just needs some rounding out in terms of who gets it and how much. Okay, and and Rhonda has given us uh, multiple options um, for that, or at least two options. That is correct, and I can share that information again if that would be helpful um, for you guys to provide input on what you want this one time line item to represent. I mean, we're at, at the top end of the scale, we're looking at um, over a million dollars, a little over a million. And the low end was, I believe, um, roughly a hundred thousand short of that. So, Nine to nine fifty on the low end. Yeah, I, I mean, I I don't know why we wouldn't ask for all. I mean, because I mean, by your numbers, it's showing the disparity on the the amount that uh, our lowest paid employees would get. So um, anyway, any any other comments for any other board members on the, the budget? Will, are you going to speak to the public comment um, piece of this and how we're collecting public comment? Yes, uh, that was the next item. Um, so the, the way that public comment was, was done um, is that uh, every WebEx meeting for our meetings will be a separate event and people will register for that. When they register, they get the opportunity to uh, specify if they want to speak to an agenda item. Um, Todd has sent me uh, everybody that signed up, so I have the list and uh, he has forwarded that to, to Tanya as well. Uh, at this time, we have nobody that has signed up to specifically speak uh, to the uh, budget items, but um, the public still can, can email the board uh, reach out to us, uh, phone, any number of ways. Uh, I know, Dr. Felder, we are putting together a, a survey item, I believe, or a, a Google Doc where someone could go in and just fill that out if they would prefer versus sending an email. Is that still the plan, Dr. Felder? I believe so, yes. Um, Mr. Jones, can you speak? to that i believe well, that we, was something we were working on on the website we uh we offered the link to the registration and when i went and downloaded that just a little while ago i think there was 18 people on the list or maybe 16 people on the list but none had specified a uh a item in the agenda that they wanted to uh, comment on uh, so we also provided an alternative uh, a link to the uh the OCS board member email group so that all the board members would be receiving any input that the public wanted to provide. Uh, so it sounds like we're not doing the survey, but I do request Dr. Felder that we do do a connect ad to inform our community that we are going through budget and that we are uh, looking for uh, public feedback and comments. Uh, to budget. So we can definitely do a connect ed. Um, we can also still do the survey um, as that was something that we did discuss. And so I, I don't think it's too late okay. to do a survey. That would be great because I think it will help people uh, hone in on the area that they would like to talk about and give specific feedback. Okay, so okay. If we could do both of those. That would be great. Um, so currently for the uh, meeting minutes, we do not have anybody signed up. Uh, 
from a board perspective, any comments or concerns with uh, doing the connect ad, doing a survey, um, and then uh, just trying to pull people to get uh, comments back on the budget? My only um, suggestion on this, I'm glad we're gonna do the survey as well, is if we can put this um, somewhere, maybe on the, wherever, on the, on the website, and if we are able to include the links to the presentation, the presentation from last time that had a bunch of the sort of expansion request information, as well as this, because um, I think if, if someone just were to look at this, it would be hard to know sort of more of the story. And I think that other deck from last time did a great job of that. So um, if the hope is to give people something to respond to, I think including that information where they can easily find it would be helpful. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Sarah. So maybe- Will. That, uh, that, just, that was uh, yeah, just a second, Matthew. So it, it sounds like if uh, we can put this in a common area on the website, a budget or a link where they can get access to the materials, um, that way, like uh, and people, people will be able to see the material and understand uh, the background of it versus us just having the, the raw survey. Uh, Matthew? When you're uh, reaching out, uh, I would request that we reach out to the school improvement team members and the PTA, Parent Teacher Association, Student Association, and get their feedback on the budget also, uh, addressing needs that's specific to their schools. Yeah, the Connect Ed. Uh... Um, I'm saying send it to the actual PTA and the school improvement team so that they get a separate reminder. Yeah, I'm not sure how we send it to the PTAs. Um, have, the, have the principals reach out to them. Any other comments or questions? I appreciate everyone's feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Thanks, Rhonda. Thank you, Rhonda. Thanks, Rhonda. All right. The next agenda item is uh, a code launch memoranda of understanding from engaging schools. All right, good evening. This is Dr. Gammon. I'm here with Mrs. Cobb as well as Mr. Johnson. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, we are going to present this evening um, the Code of Conduct Memorandum of Understanding. Um, this is uh, something that's already been approved by the board as far as our work with engaging schools, but the MOU has been um, with Mr. Blumberg's office, they have vetted and approved this MOU um, to pass before you. Through our partnership with Engaging Schools, we're seeking your approval to move forward with the implementation of our revised student code of conduct. Um, in light of the recent events with school closing, um, we are in um, constant communication with Engaging Schools um, to ensure that the launch and the rollout as far as professional development and support um, of all of our stakeholders um, we'll continue to carry on through the spring and into the summer so that we can be prepared, um, hopefully, for a July rollout as we've planned. Um, but we're in the process of making shifts to a virtual uh, professional development format with engaging schools. They did share us updated information today. Um, but this is just for an action item for you all to, to take a look at um, and just to prove so that we can go ahead and move forward with this partnership to get this off the ground. Sure. Any questions this evening about the code launch and the memorandum of understanding? Oh, it's an action item. I move the approval. Second. Okay, discussion. So uh I, I do have a, a question on on this. So the memoranda shows 50K in it. Is that the 
we've already that's the agreed upon amount that we already have been under contract under or this is in addition to the original amount that we were paying for them to create the content for the code. Oh, this is the amount that we have been yeah, under contract with them before. before. This, this is not an additional, additional this money, money was already set aside for this. this. Okay. Um, the second question I had is, uh, given the shift in the um, uh, school closures, uh, do we know when the uh, code of conduct will come back for the board for approval. Obviously, I'm concerned with the timing of the board approving versus it going out for the training. Uh, I, I don't know, obviously, if the board sees it and has changes to it or has concerns or wants to make changes that would greatly affect the ability to, to roll it out. So ha has that changed? from when the approval will come to the board? Our goal is still to bring it before the board in June. Um, again, we are working with them to do virtual trainings and um, make the necessary changes virtually, uh, but our goal is still to come to the board in June with that for approval. Training starting in July. No, our training would start once this is approved, we will start with the virtual training with the with the team then um, and make all the final because we we just have some grammatical things that we needed to correct um, and bring back before the board. Okay. All right, that's all the question I had any anybody else. All, right, all in favor. Aye. 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 All right, motion carries. Thank you. All. Okay, uh, next agenda item is contract addendment uh, forthright advising. Yes, uh, so this would be the um, second addendum uh, to uh, the forthright advising's contract. And so, as you know, uh, the district currently does not have a communications division. Uh, and we have been engaging engaging with forthright advising uh, to support us around um, uh, major communications. Uh, some of it we've been able to manage on our own, um, but especially in times such as these, uh, their support has been invaluable. And so the request is uh, to increase the amount of the contract as we are quickly approaching um, the uh, current uh, limit on uh, the current contract. Uh, while I hope not to exceed or need to uh, uh, go further than what we are requesting now, uh, the idea is also each time that we have to go back uh, to negotiate a contract, there are legal costs. And so um, uh, just trying to think ahead uh, as hiring is on a hold right now, uh, we will continue to need rights uh, support. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Move adoption. Second. Uh, okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Uh, we now have. Uh, uh, our information only. Uh, probably uh, one of the most important updates I was talking about uh, what kind of swings to the coronavirus. Uh, we'll start, uh, Dr. Bell. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Atherton. So, uh, as you all know, due to the coronavirus, uh, schools uh, schools have not been in session for students for six days. Today uh, is officially day six. I'm sure I speak for uh, all of our staff. Uh, it feels like six months. Um, and so without question, we all want our students back in school learning, uh, but, but certainly not until it is safe to do so. Uh, today, uh, the governor announced, uh, as you all know, that uh, schools will remain closed uh, at least through May 15th, and uh, 
that will be reassessed uh, as information, more information becomes available. But for right now, uh, that is the date that we are working with. And so um, Orange County, in Orange County schools, everyone has and continues to do amazing work. Um, the, everyone has remained flexible and agile and patient and understanding as we work really hard to overcome this unbelievable and unforeseen challenge. And so tonight we want to provide the board with an update with regards to uh, the district's response to the coronavirus. Uh, and I'm going to kick off with a very high level overview of the district's timeline of events uh, related to uh, the coronavirus. So there's an attachment there. I'm not sure if uh, that can be shared in any way, Todd, uh, on the screen, but if not, certainly board members, you have a copy of a, um, a one-sheeter document titled Orange County Schools COVID-19 Timeline of Events. Does everyone have that document? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, uh, again, I'll just walk you through. Uh, and so, on uh, March 4th, uh, the district um, convened a uh, COVID-19 committee, and this committee was made up or is made up of internal and external partners. Uh, staff include uh, student services, well, myself and student services, um, which includes uh, counselors, nurses, social workers, all represented, uh, curriculum and instruction uh, represented, uh, we had a principal representation, uh, operations, maintenance, facilities, transportation, um, as well as representation from the Orange County Health Department. Um, on March 12th, uh, due to the pandemic status of the virus and out of an abundance of caution, uh, the district altered its school's calendar uh, to close schools March 16th through the 27th. Uh, we identified uh, four priorities that would keep us focused throughout uh, this ordeal. Uh, that includes uh, safety uh, being our number one priority, safety for students, safety for staff, uh, safety for families and the community at large. Uh, our second focus is on food, ensuring that students uh, receive um, a nutritious uh, a food uh, throughout uh, this process as well as, uh, and so we've been able to do that and you'll hear more about that as well as providing groceries to families. Uh, a third focus has been on learning and wanting to ensure that uh, students and staff continue learning throughout uh, this time of school closure. And last but not least, ensuring that we keep people whole. And by that, we are focused on keeping our staff working as well as the social emotional needs, um, addressing those needs for our students, our families, and our staff. So then on March 14th, uh, Governor Cooper uh, closed schools statewide, uh, and that was to be through March 27th. But as we know, that date has been pushed back now to March, I'm sorry, uh, to May 15th. Uh, these school closure days are teacher work days. And again, we have been focused on our uh, four priorities. And that brings us to the present state. And that is, again, to continue focus on uh, safety, food, learning, and keeping uh, people whole uh, and planning for uh, uh, part of that includes planning for um, around um, learning how we will keep that going, how we will keep food going and um, ensuring the safety and um, keeping our staff whole and, and families and community whole. And so uh, with that, I am going to turn things over to staff to go in more depth. Uh, in particular, they will speak to, staff will speak to food distribution, so you'll hear more uh, in-depth information about that. Uh, you'll hear more in-depth information about uh, operational uh, changes and focusing on um, providing alternative work 
for staff, uh, how we have responded to ensuring that our buildings are uh, clean and uh, uh, the disinfecting process. Uh, we'll also provide an update with regards to instruction and uh, professional development uh, opportunities uh, for staff. And so uh, with that, if there are no qu questions about um, the timeline of events uh, that bring us to our uh, current work, I'm going to turn it over to staff. So any questions before we move forward? All right, so with that, I'm going to start then with uh, Ms. Cobb. So, Sharita. Good evening again. Um, just to update you, um, as Dr. Felder stated, um, beginning March 16th, 2020, we were out of school and we began supplying our students with food. Um, we had a supplemental food um, donation that was coming from Weaver Street from the Roundup program that you heard about earlier this school year. Um, from that program, we were able to provide food to 509 families that um, are from Title I schools and schools that are um, distinguished as high poverty schools. Out of that, we were able to supply 996 students with food. Then as a part of um, the staff going into their food pantries and putting together boxes for some other high need areas, uh, they were able to supply 110 families with food boxes, which served 244 students. We also began our food distribution sites in the community um, with child nutrition and transportation. We began on March 16th with 179 uh, bags being given out and ended the week on March 20th with 629 bags being given out. So we were able to um, change some of the things that we were doing. We added some different routes. We added different locations in order to make sure that we were reaching as many students as we possibly could. And I'd like to report that today, our total lunches served, and, and today we began to give breakfast along but, with lunch. Sharita, will you oh, stop mind. a minute? Yeah. Hold on it, one second. Was Dr. Let me turn it my volume up. I'm yeah, sorry, go ahead. It was Dr. Felder. She she muted. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. It, it was too much. Okay. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of feedback and so we couldn't hear you. On, okay. On you want me to go back? No, no. Okay. So I was just saying that um, this week, um, well, that same week, March 16th, we began our lunch distributions. We started out with 179 students or bags being given out. And we ended the week with 629 bags being given out. Um, starting today, we began serving breakfast along with lunch in those bags and added some additional locations and stop, stops. And um, at the end of the day today, we served 726 meals to students. We have begun discussions and have a plan to continue to do um, feeding sites during spring break. So we will be providing food for students throughout um, spring break as well. Um, we've also continued, as Dr. Felder mentioned, when we talk about the whole child, we have been sharing social emotional supports, mental health supports, other food resources within our communities, with our families. We began that on the 16th or when we first found out we were going to be closed and student support services begin, continues to look up and find different resources that we can provide with uh, our families with as far as social emotional support, food support and things like that. I would like to say that it has been a great collaboration between transportation, um, operations and child nutrition in making sure that we are feeding all of our kids. And as you know, we are doing a food drive um, where we are trying to you know, take in as much food as we can so we can make more food boxes for fam families to have to take home uh, to last throughout the weekend or what have you and then start over again. Thanks to Rhonda, she was able to set up a K-12 uh, program where Anyone, community members, um, parents, staff, whomever would like to can make um, monetary donations 
so that we can then go and purchase um, non-perishable food items to supply those boxes with as well. Any questions? Can I share a comment? Yes, ma'am. Um, I mean, thank you. Thank, thank you to everybody. I, I, um, I have seen um, this start, I mean, this needed to come together so quickly and it has grown and grown. I've seen you add all of those new drop-off locations, all of these new meals, being able to add the breakfast, um, adding this, this um, I think about the cash donations was something I had asked Dr. Felder about. It has happened. I put, I made my donation. Um, so I really think we should publicize that one because, you know, for people who um, may not want to go out to the store or something, if that can allow you all to purchase more for families, I think that's a really great way. So I would love to see us publicize that one some more, but I just want to say thank you. Um, this is unprecedented and I just really, um, I'm so grateful to, to you and the whole cabinet. Thank you, Sharita, you'll hear from me this week. Uh, the state is pulling together a report uh, showing what all districts are doing. And I will get with you because um, the School Boards Association is leading, uh, is leading that effort and we're doing that Wednesday. So I'll talk to you later. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Sharita, as usual, another outstanding job. Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> Are there any other comments or questions? Just a big thank you from me also to everyone. This is heroic and I'm so grateful to all of you. I would also say that, um, you know, similar to what uh, Sarah said, um, the, the outreach from Hillsboro, town of Hillsboro, uh, the mayor, uh, just everyone coming together, uh, lots of families with the help of gathering the food. Um, it, it's just been monumental, just in coordination. I even got, um, a call this morning for perishable food. I don't know, Sharita, if we were able to accommodate that, but there was a business that was closing and it had additional food that was perishable and it wanted to offer us that food um, because they couldn't use it and they were gonna close. So I just appreciate, you know, everything that everybody's done. It, it's just been a unbelievable turnaround <clears throat> in a short period of time to be able to accommodate the community. I appreciate everybody's effort and you know making it possible and making sure you know, all of our families are are taken care of. So thank y'all. Yep. So as a time, if you would please share that information with me. I didn't get that information about the perishable food, but um, if you could share that with me in an email, that would be great. I will absolutely do that now. Okay. Any other uh, comments, questions? With regards to food, I, I too um, am just beyond um, impressed with the efforts um, that Sharita has led uh, along with transportation um, and um, Sarah Pitts. Uh, it, it's been an incredible effort, but I would be remiss and I have to echo what um, Sharita said, and that is that, you know, there are still concerns with regards to not lunch type meals uh, that we, we we're not concerned about, but it's the grocery type meals. And um, we are concerned about um, the number of families uh, who maybe not be in food insecure today, uh, but may become food insecure uh, going forward and as a community continue to meet that needs. Um, food, uh, one of our four major priorities and um, looking to collaborate with whomever we need to in, in order to ensure that our students and families have 
uh, that particular basic need met. Okay, so with that, uh, we're gonna move to the next item and that would actually be uh, to hear from uh, Dr. Keeling. Uh, she is going to speak to us and give an update with regards to school visits. And so on the uh, first day of school and actually throughout uh, last week, um, the central office staff um, dispersed into schools uh, to be of support um, in any way that we could be of support to them. And um, as she has a few um, comments and observations to share and provide you with an update on. So Dr. Keeling. Sure, I, I was um, just gonna give like an overview in terms of the, the district being very focused on equity in this time and then um, pass the mic to um, Mr. Johnson, who has more information in terms of us going into schools and um, what that has looked like. But I do just want to say that in um, terms of equity, um, everyone has been very focused on making sure that the needs of all of our students are being met. Um, as we heard from Ms. Cobb, making sure that uh, food is getting out to all of the different um, students and their families, uh, making sure that all of our resources are translated in both print and as well in communication, that it's all done in Spanish as well as in English. Um, also had some contact with the um, Immigrant and Refugee Health Program um, Orange County Immigrant and Refugee Health Program, which gave us some information on uh, COVID-19, a multilingual resource. So we made that available to parents as well. Um, and in that resource, it has things such as how to wash your hands, making sure you um, everything that you need to know and keeping updated, social distancing, um, that multilingual resource page also has videos in English, Spanish, and in American Sign Language for residents who are um, deaf or hard of hearing. So making sure to just get the information out in as many different formats as we can and making sure everyone is getting that. Um, we're also focused heavily on not just the, the social and emotional and academic needs of our students and families, but also on our staff. And so when we're having our discussions, um, as Dr. Felder said, that's one of our priorities. So when we're um, going around to the schools and we're, we're collecting information, where we're trying to get some feedback from staff of um, how they're feeling and bringing that back to the table so that when we have our discussions, we're, we're focused on making sure that bus drivers and child nutrition, that they, have um, work to be done so that income is constantly coming in. That was one of the things that we talked about. We wanna make sure that people are getting paid that wanna get paid. Um, we are sharing professional development with staff. We want staff to stay engaged as well. Um, so last week I, I shared a, a movie with them, Push Out the Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools. So I, I shared that with staff so that they could access and watch that movie. Uh, we also participated in Education Week's online summit, which was titled Uproot in Inequities in Schools. I was a, a guest speaker in one of the, the rooms. There were seven different topics. And so staff registered for that. And um, I could see in my room, different members of Orange County School staff participating, um, but I also, in our discussion with um, principals and curriculum and instruction, heard some of the feedback from having attended that online professional development. And um, me going back in and reading um, all the different transcripts from each of those topics, because there's a lot of resources for staff from uh, around the country, educators around the country who are grappling with the same issue of making sure that we are very equity focused in this time of COVID-19. I think across the country that has been a resounding theme that I have heard, um, everyone trying to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our students and our families. Um, and so 
our, our cabinet has been expanded to uh, include more stakeholders uh, such as like Connie Cremins and uh, Katina so that we're, we're having EC at the table, we're having bus drivers at the table. So I think um, all of those speak to us having this continual focus on um, making sure the needs are met for all of our students and being equity minded. So I'll, I'll turn it over to um, Jason if he wants to discuss uh, actually going into the schools each day last week. Thank you, Dr. Keelan, um, and good evening. So yes, we did do a series of school visits. Cabinet members and directors began a series last Monday of visiting schools. These visits continued throughout the week. Um, principal and staff members were very appreciative of our presence. During these school visits, we noticed and observed staff working together to ensure that students' needs were being met in the areas of food, instruction, and social and emotional support. We also heard some concerns from staff members. One of the things that we observed teachers and teachers assistants doing, they were putting together instructional packets for the next two weeks. Many teachers are working on instructional material for students. Um, we observed principals working with staff members on plans to communicate with individual families while we're out. They did a good, the principal did a good job of setting the expectation that families would get at least one phone call a week while we're out. These phone calls were not limited just to a week. Also, staff members were expected to deliver the message to families that we were available every day if they needed anything. Staff members were instructed to speak with families about services that the district had in place for them. Now, some of the concerns that we were hearing from staff members, they were definitely concerned around making sure we have food and meaningful learning um, materials for our students. Teachers were also concerned about our lower paid employees in the district, and they wanted to make sure that they were taken care of, such as our bus drivers and our TAs, our classified staff. Teachers were very concerned about ensuring that they were taken care of. Um, what we really observed was just a lot of people coming together, working hard on behalf of our students and the greater Orange County community. Then we, we observed on Tuesday, March 17th, we observed many staff members working together to get food for our students. Many staff members were collecting food, packing bags, and handing out food to our families. They also continued with preparing for providing supplemental instruction at home. Wednesday and Thursday last week, we, we met with our principals virtually, as well as our assistant principals. The purpose of these meetings was to continue giving them updates on where we stood with services for our families, such as food and instructional matters. We also were having these meetings to clear up any lingering questions, concerns, and to receive their feedback. Our next meeting with our principals will be tomorrow to give them more updates and receive their feedback. Are there any questions? Any questions from anybody? Um, one, one question I do have uh, is um, how, how are families and students going to get the next two weeks of material? How's that going to be different? Right. And so, Mr. Atherton, um, actually, Dr. Gammon is going to speak to that. Okay. So, yep, that's on the agenda. We're going to okay. talk. No problem. He just brought up uh, they were working on it. I know. I know. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Fountain. So uh, thank you, Dr. Keeling and um, um, Mr. Mr. Johnson. Greatly appreciate uh, you sharing. And so uh, next up would be um, uh, Mrs. Pitts, and she is going to speak about, um, provide updates on the work that operations has been engaged in. So Mrs. Pitts. Good evening, everyone. I just want to say thank you for your time. Uh, the safety of Orange County Schools students and staff is and continues to be our top priority. As we continue to respond to the ever evolving situation surrounding COVID-19, we will continue to take proactive steps to protect our OCS community in accordance with CDC, NCDHHS, the local health department, and medical experts. 
In the beginning, all our staff members were highly encouraged to follow the guidance of CDC, talking about if you're sick, stay home. We had multiple things going out about washing your hands. We encouraged staff, you know, of course, to avoid touching their eyes, their nose, their mouth. We talked about social distancing and we still encourage social distancing for those who are still working. Um, and we also emphasized our enhanced procedures that employees should follow when assessing their fitness to return to work, whether or not they were sick, risks of exposure after any personal travel and being around other people, and then our recommended quarantine after potential exposure. So as you know, at an abundance of caution to protect the health of our staff and students, Orange County Schools modified normal operations in buildings to close the buildings to students and most of our staff. To assure that the buildings and buses are ready for a return to normal operation, we are also in the process of implementing the following measures, which include encouraging any and all staff that can work from home to work from home, ensuring that all staff who continue to work within our buildings are equipped with gloves, disinfectant cleaners, and any other items which may be needed to ensure that their work areas are clean and also to protect their safety. We have spent a lot of time talking about use of chemicals and PPE. We're also training our staff on chemical hygiene and other items to assist with our cleaning efforts. We're verifying that all hand sanitizer stations located throughout the school facilities are properly stocked at all times. And we have added portable hand sanitizer stations to lobbies and high traffic areas within our buildings so those who are working can make sure that they hit those quite frequently. We are thoroughly cleaning all of our buses and have cleaned them with an EPA registered disinfectant for COVID-19. We've temporarily closed all of our playgrounds to the public as our equipment is not sanitized and the CDC has spoke about how long this potential virus can stick on porous surfaces. We are implementing enhanced protocols for cleaning and sanitizing of our equipment throughout the building, including more frequent cleaning and additional cleaning with an EPA Proof sanitizer of our high traffic areas. Our staff are currently cleaning all items which come into contact with students and staff quite frequently, including our desks, tables, chairs, our door handles, our railings, all toys that would be in pre-K and kindergarten areas, and also our gym equipment that students will come into contact with when they come back. We're also working diligently with our contracted cleaning company to create a cohesive and thorough plan to ensure that all buildings are properly cleaned and remain clean until normal operations resume. We're making sure that our staff know to put their health first and foremost as we face this situation together. And we're participating in professional development and training opportunities to ensure that our cleaning procedures follow best practices. We are and will continue to work tirelessly to do what is best for our staff and our students. Our operations and cleaning efforts will constantly be analyzed and reviewed to ensure that we comply the guidelines given by the CDC and the health department. We are committed to our efforts in making Orange County Schools the first choice for our staff and students, and we'll make sure that our actions follow that. Are there any questions for me tonight? This is Sarah, I have one. Um, but first, Ms. Pitts, I wanna say thank you. And um, I just think about the role that you have stepped into from your previous role and like what a what a person to be in this spot right now um, with your background in environmental health and everything. So grateful for you. Um, uh, I am wondering if we have looked at whether the school district has any N95 masks that we could donate to hospitals. Um, I asked because um, I happened to have a box of them in my basement from a woodworking project. And I know we have like woodworking courses and things. And if we have extra supplies that are not in use, um, just hearing the desperate need um, and under supply in hospitals, um, having several ER docs in my family and um, just really concerned about getting supplies. I did have a conversation with our nurses this morning. They are going to look at all of our medical supplies to see if we have any. We also took a look at the maintenance warehouse I believe we may have maybe one extra box. They're not something that we typically stock because you have to have the fit test done on them. So if we have any supplies, they will be um, small compared to probably what most other facilities can donate. But we have definitely started the search to see what we could find to donate to benefit our first responders. Appreciate that, thank you. 
any other comments from any board members? No, well, let me just say one thing. Uh, I mentioned this to you already, Will, and to Dr. Felder, but I was glad to hear uh, Sarah say that they're keeping the playgrounds cleared because, you know, I got a call with complaint that people are congregating at Hillsborough Elementary. So I am glad to hear that they are keeping the playgrounds cleared. So I just wanted to clarify, uh, Mrs. Stevens, and thank you so much for bringing that concern uh, to our attention. Um, as Mrs. Pitt said, we certainly have put up um, notices and um, I, and I have gotten responses based on the notices that we have, uh, uh, but I don't want anyone to think that we're also policing the grounds. And so that unfortunately we're not able to do. And so, uh, but we have certainly made it clear with signage. We certainly made it clear about um, uh, the status of our playground equipment, meaning schools are closed. So the playground equipment is off limits as well uh, in the FAQ families. But um, that's about the extent of which we are able to, um, you know, communicate with families about um, the playground equipment and, um, you know, any concerns that it may pose with regards to uh, the coronavirus. I would just like to say uh, thank you to Ms. Pitt as well. I, I, you know, at the start, I saw at multiple schools with the food drive, loading up food into the buses and, you know, just all out and about during all of this. So I just wanted to say uh, thank you, Ms. Pitts, for all your work and efforts in all of these areas. Like uh, Sarah Smiley had mentioned, your your background and your knowledge has just very helpful given all the challenges we've had. So thank you for stepping into this. All right. So thank you, uh, Mrs. Pitts. And so uh, with that, um, we are going to move to the next and last update for tonight. And that would be uh, to hear from uh, Dr. Gammon. So Dr. Gammon is going to speak to the instructional uh, part of our focus, how we're keeping uh, learning uh, a focus in the district. Dr. Gammon. Thank you, Dr. Felder. Uh, good evening. So Orange County Schools, our district curriculum and instruction team has been working in conjunction with school principals. Um, we've partnered together to develop uh, what we're calling our Orange County Schools distance learning team. Uh, this distance learning team will consist of, of three separate um, groups. One group is working pre-K through fifth grade. Um, one group is working middle grade, sixth through eighth. And then one group is working nine, twelve. Um, we're working those under the umbrella of our central office or our, our um, CNI facilitator team. Um, so what we've we've basically uh, worked together this past week. I mean, if you remember when we met face to face um, at the last board meeting, we talked about our 24 hour turnaround between March 12th and 13th to get materials um, home with students that would last through March 27th. Um, we um, functioned at that time knowing that we would most likely not return to school on April 6th. So we spent a great deal of time this past week going ahead and preparing this distance learning team um, to mobilize um, resources and instructional materials for students in the event that we did not return to school on April 6th. Um, we held our first large Google Hangout session this past week, um, three different sessions um, with those three separate groups. Those groups are comprised of teacher leaders as well as support staff across every school. Um, they were selected by their principals. Um, and they were, were obviously given the opportunity to bow out of those teams if they chose not to be a part of that. Um, we had almost, I would say, 99.9% .9 rate as far as participation in that. Um, I do want to lead um, with this before I get into the specifics of the distance learning team. Um, I do want to, to make sure that, that it's very, it's imperative to note um, that we're working through unprecedented times, as you know, um, and we are noting every time we communicate with our staff um, that we are very mindful and empathetic to the challenges that not only our families and our students are facing, um, but that our staff members are facing and their families are facing, their friends, um, their loved ones. Um, and we want them all to know that at this time that we are leading from that place of empathy and from that place of grace 
um, that, that is district wide that we are coming from that lens. Um, and so we also want them to understand that there is not a blueprint for this work right now. We've been in, in constant communication um, with other district leaders across the state who, who are kind of searching for answers just like we are. Um, but we're also realistic that this is an ever changing situation, um, this pandemic, and we continue to highlight to them that their health and their safety are paramount. Um, but as Dr. Felder mentioned earlier this evening, we do have our four areas of focus, that third area being instruction. So we do have a duty and a responsibility to continue to serve our students in that manner as well. So the, the goal of this distance learning team, number one is to provide a clear line of communication, pre-K 12. Um, we know that, that immediately when we um, left school on March 12th and 13th, we had teachers all over the place um, and building level leaders that were creating awesome learning experiences for kids. But we also know that in order for us to ensure equity and access for our students, that there needs to be a, a centralized voice um, so that we are all communicating the same language across all schools and across all grade levels so that I, all of our students are being reached to the best of our ability. Um, Connie Crimmins is on this call as well so that she can, can jump in to speak to the um, special education side of this. Um, but we also want everyone to know that at this time, as of tonight, we are still functioning in this lane of providing supplemental materials and practice materials for students. Although we have extended um, the, the cl school closure to May 15th, that does not mean that we've made this full transition back to core instruction. Um, that is still something that we are in discussion about um, with our state level leaders. If and when that does happen, um, we will be very clear about that, but right now, what our distance learning team is doing is they basically have laid some common parameters, um, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and then 9, 12, as well as pre-K of just common expectations. And so, for example, I'm not going to read this across every single grade level band, but third through fifth grade, for example, some common expectations that we want all teachers to make sure they're adhering to are that students are reading. Um, and, and that if they are, are, are not able to read, that they have someone that reads to them for at least 30 minutes daily, um, a mixture of fiction and nonfiction resources. Um, those can be through a hybrid of online and or hard copy um, hands-on materials. Um, we are asking that there is engagement in mathematics problem solving activities daily, and that there are student opportunities to engage in science and social studies related activities. Um, those can be connected through literacy um, and or mathematics. And we are also asking that 20 to 25 minutes in that grade level band um, are spending time writing. We realize that this is a wonderful time for, for students to not only write about things that they are assigned, but it's an opportunity for them to write about the, the life experience that they are working through right now, just like we are. It's a great way for them to capture that from a social emotional lens and to be able to really freely write out their experiences. In, in an effort to make sure we mobilize this appropriately, what we've asked the distant learning team to do is to create choice boards. Um, these choice boards, for example, if I am a third grade teacher at Cameron Park, I'm working alongside third grade teachers from every other school in the district. Um, and we are creating a choice board that will go out uh, through a, a website that Ryan Miller is putting together. It would go live when we come back from spring break. Um, on those choice board options, students will have nine to 12 options of work that they can complete. Um, they are being asked to complete up to five items because we're trying to be mindful again of the equity and access piece. Um, but depending on how um, deep the thinking is with those items and how much work is required, students could spend potentially multiple days on an item, or it could be something where they're able to do multiple items in one day. Um, but we are we are requiring that for everything that is created digitally, that we have a hard copy, um, either replica of that, or we have something that is very similar hard copy, um, so that we are not providing just something on a digital platform that doesn't have the hard copy option. Um, we we this has been a, a really interesting time because we're we're working through um, a, a lot of competing factors here. Um, I do want to be very transparent this evening with you that we realize that there are going to be students that have complete access to digital um, components, and we are going to work together with schools to send out surveys through their Connect Ed um, to determine how many students are able to access online. 
um, the way we are treating this is if, if families respond that they do not have online access, we are creating these hard copy packets. Um, and essentially these would be bags of materials that we would get to families. And if families do not respond to the survey at all, we will also treat that as they do not have digital access. And so we are, are accounting for them in that way as well. The challenge that we're facing right now is how do we get those materials to our families? Um, some of the pieces that we've talked through um, th this past week are um, we, we have options to potentially have those um, staged outside of schools so that families can come through similar to the way they picked up food. They can come through and pick up bags of materials. Um, we have opportunities to potentially have these at those food pickup locations so that families can come for kind of a one-stop shop where they get food as well as um, those paper copies of items. Um, we've even talked through down the line, potentially having ways that we deliver these materials to students. Um, but, I, but I just want to be very clear that we are thinking through um, um, very intentionally on a daily basis of what's going to be the best way to get these materials out to our kids. I will say that our teachers that are on the distance learning team, that they have been so supportive. Um, they have been just, just top notch. They have, have agreed to meet on Google Hangout sessions. Um, throughout this week in the in the effort to have all of this stuff together, these choice boards prepared by Friday of this week um, and vetted by Friday of this week, translated by Friday of this week. Um, the goal being that when students return after spring break that we would have this ready to be mobilized and ready to go. Um, I, I, the last couple of things, the state did provide um, a content matrix to all schools, school systems that we've been functioning off of. We have used this as kind of our common um, platform that we've passed to each one of our grade level teams so that we are, are at least compiling at the district level a consistent way to uh, account for the work that's going out. Um, on this matrix, teachers are basically noting the general approach um, to the, the supplemental and practice materials that they are taking. They're also noting the external digital content that they may be using as well as any hard copy resources that they may be using. Um, so we have that crafted in a way that we can keep track of that um, and that we can provide feedback throughout this process to ensure that we're getting as much um, uh, equity and access um, to our folks as possible. I think at the end of the day, and I know that this is a lot of information to share, um, we do want to constantly go back to the fact that we want our families to understand that we realize that their safety and their health is paramount. Um, we are not in the lane of focusing on grading right now. We are focusing on getting resources out to our students um, and connecting with our kids, ensuring that teachers are continuing to communicate with families um, so that we can check on them and their well-being um, and, and just to be there for them as the bottom line. So that's kind of our plan at this point in time. And again, it will continue to evolve as the days and weeks um, come to us. Do you all have any questions? Will, go ahead, uh, Dr. Gammon. Two things. I like the idea about having their uh, supplemental work at the food pickup locations. Uh, that will make it easier on parents, and then also uh, uh, reaching out to parents via phone calls because you're you're gonna at once you do your survey, I think you're gonna find a lot of children don't have access to it internet that's working to where they can use it. The other one is trying to reach out to parents and see if we need to, uh, when they're picking up supplemental educational materials, do they need anything uh, as far as books? Do they have new materials to read? Yes, sir, Mr. Roberts, and I appreciate that. We, we have had those conversations. Our media specialists have been a part of the distance learning team communication. They are very much on board um, with continuing to, to empty those library spaces, even the classroom libraries, and getting those books into the hands of students. Um, I think we're taking the approach that, that we would rather um, students continue reading at this point, continue engaging. Um, and not be as worried about whether the book returns at this point, because that's something that we can replace over time. But we want to make sure. sure that we're getting those things in the hands of our kids as much as possible. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Other comments? Um, I have a couple of things, comment, question. Um, start with comment. Um, so as a parent um, of 
kids who have been on the receiving end of this for um, the past week, I just wanted to say um, thank you um, and congratulations on pulling together so much so quickly. I know that um, packets were photocopied on that Friday. I know that people from the central office were sent out to schools to help with the photocopying. Um, and um, I know that the, you know, my kids' teachers have been in, in in touch. They've been on Zoom meetings. They've been checking in to see how things are going. And I just really, really um, appreciate all the work that's going into this really totally mind blowing situation that I can't believe is happening. Um, I uh, and I appreciate that we are going to be surveying families to find out if they are connected and have good, um, reliable internet. Um, and like that we are having a plan for a hard copy, if not. Um, I have some questions. There are really sort of two questions. Um, one of them is, you know, knowing that we are going to be doing this for another two months and maybe longer is our goal. Like, are we trying to get every kid online? Are we trying to um, find ways to bridge that gap for people um, and, and eventually go to something all digital? Or do we think that actually this like hybrid version um, can work. Um, one reflection that I have as a parent um, was just sort of seeing like some of the kids from my daughter's class were on the Zoom call and some of them weren't, um, right? And and just thinking about who's then getting sort of the additional time with classmates, the additional time with teachers, um, and um, how that can just exacerbate things, which I know you all are thinking about very much. Um, I guess the moment just really has me wondering, um, if there is some way to better tier our response to students in a way, um, to sort of think about who are the students who most need these two months of learning. And I know right now we're doing sort of enrichment, but like who are the kids that are gonna lose out most by not being in a classroom with a teacher for these two months? And how can we tier what teachers are doing in order to get, is there a way <laughs> to get them more during this time rather than um, sort of an equal amount but offline that's that's what's on my mind i don't have a solution to it so the first question was are we trying to get all the kids online and the second one was are you thinking at all about that and sort of not even just sort of like how to have an equivalent but how to get the kids who most need that learning time additional support resources whatever it is sure that both questions are phenomenal and there are things that we've definitely talked about i know that the trying to get all kids online we have, have discussed this this will be something that we will be a more conversation with our local providers as well as mr jones um, specifically i know that we have thrown around the idea of do we need to focus or target on um, some of our higher grade level kids that are trying to finish i.e our seniors that, that are trying to finish out um, do we need to try to look at it in that way so that it's more manageable or is this something that we want to try to scale full system wide? I do not have an answer to that, but I do want you to know that we definitely have been in conversation about that. Um, I, I also, as far as the hybrid piece, um, we are functioning in that way right now just because of the equity and access. Mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that we're getting to as many folks as possible. Um, the, the tiering piece, um, that, that is really a, a place that we know that we're going to eventually get to. Um, I think because we're giving more practice and supplemental materials right now, we're trying to have just kind of a general baseline. And, and within that, I didn't, I didn't explain it a minute ago, but within those grade level bands, we have building level folks that may be your ESL specialists, that may be your EEC teachers, um, that may be your AIG specialists, as well as those district folks that are essentially taking what is kind of the base level content that's being put together, and then they are either enriching it or they are providing additional scaffolds and support for those so that we are trying to, even on practice materials, expand that net as best we can through those choice boards. Um, I do know that if we make this shift to core instruction, and I haven't heard that clearly from the state yet, um, we are certainly going to have to really rethink how we're approaching things and how much, how much ownership will then go back to the PLC level at the buildings um, because they are going to kind of know where they are from a scope and sequence standpoint, from a pacing standpoint. And then are, are we at a place there that we are focusing on just finding the power standards that, that they would need to cover for the remainder of third quarter into fourth quarter because we would have such a short turnaround um, from May 15th and beyond? Um, or is that something where we would try to hit you know as many of those key things as we can and then try to expand into next year? I, I don't know what that will look like at this point. 
it's such uncharted territory that, that we're definitely I'm thinking, but if there are ideas, one thing I would encourage everybody who's on this call, and I've said it to everybody I've talked to, um, this is not a time to have too much pride. Um, anybody who has answers, anybody who has ideas that they're compiling from other places, continue to see them our way, and we will vet those um, and use them to the best of our ability. So I, I do appreciate it. Thank you. The other piece I do have is um, uh, Ms. Crimmins um, hearing, you know, I know that um, exceptional children creates particular responsibilities and challenges. And so could you speak a little bit to how, how you're approaching that? Um, so, you know, over the past week or 10 days, we've worked closely with other district directors, the Council for Excep Exceptional Children at the national level, the Council for Administrators of Special Education, um, the EC division of DPI, as well as Therrington Smith, in order to get guidance on instruction while we are um, not under the obligation to provide the free and appropriate public ed education. But with that being said, we want to be um, mindful and accessible and make sure that our students get as much as they can during this time. So um, last Friday, I think was um, the case the Council for Accept or Administrators of Special Ed and the CEC held a webinar that gave us, gave district leaders in special ed the most concrete information and guidance to date that we've received um, on how to administer special education while school is not in session. So uh, over the weekend, I developed a guidance document. And so it's kind of flexible and all holds bar right now if teachers want to do Google Classrooms, um, if they want to do anything they can to reach their students in terms of um, teletherapy is something being investigated by our related services. Our HI, our hearing impaired specialists and our visually impaired specialists are um, reaching out to the students they serve so that um, accessibility barriers, we can put those we can try to take those way away as the best of our abilities. Our assistive tech team has been phenomenal. Um, they are looking to make sure that all the accessibility features are turned on on computers. How can they make sure that parents have uh, communication devices for their students so that um, parents are able to continue on with that communication? Um, there, the EC teachers are working very closely with the distance learning teams because we have to remember that in special education you have students that have articulation errors all the way to the students with low incidence disabilities who are deaf blind. So this is really a challenge, um, but I feel like the input that I'm getting from all of the teachers that have been reaching out to students is that um, everyone has been taken care of and teachers are communicating the EC department, we are having multiple meetings um, with different groups of individuals to get information and find out where those barriers are. So um, tomorrow it's the separate setting teachers, but every feedback I have, um, our teachers are reaching out and thus far accessibility and um, is not a barrier. That's great to hear. Thank you so much for that update. Oh, you're welcome. Any other board comments or questions? I have one more. Is that okay? Uh, oh, go ahead. Yes, it's okay. I'm a board member. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, as I think about, here, here's the thought. Here's the thought. The thought is, you know, I talked to um, a friend who's on a school board in Minnesota, and she was telling me about how in her district, um, they're, they're the social workers, guidance counselors, basically a whole set of people who, you know, have phones for work and are just regularly doing that. Um, they're making sure that they speak to each family and understand some of the things that we're gonna get through the survey, right? Like, do you have reliable internet access? Um, do you have um, food needs? Um, do you have other sort of needs as a family? Um, and, and they're just sort of like figuring out like a whole set of things. Um, and, uh, what I hope for us, what I hope to be true of us in one way or another, not necessarily individual phone calls, is that we could say, 
we know what the deal is with each kid um, or with each family in this district. Like we know for each kid, like, do they have internet? Like, do they, are they food secure? Do they have like, if they have mental health challenges or other social emotional challenges, like have we, do we know that and we, have we connected them? And, and just know what this, are, do they have actually an ability and space and time to learn like, or, or you know, is, is sort of the, the situation in which the childcare is working out, like that's really challenging. Um, I would hope that like when we get to some end of this, I would hope that throughout this, we would have some sense of that. And then at the end, be able to say that we knew what was happening, like for each kid and each family in the district. Um, and so, you know, that teachers are checking in. I just, I, I don't know if we have any systematic way to understand what we know and what we don't know about families, but that is, that's sort of my offering and, and hope um, is that we would be able to know that. So Miss Smiley, this is um, Sharita Cobb and um, I can speak to um, our social workers, our counselors, and um, even our nurses, um, they are aware of the needs of our students around social emotional learning, around food insecure. That's how um, we know which places we need to add to our um, list of food sites that we are taking food to. Um, we have been working with our school-based mental health services, and they are contacting families. They are doing tele um, conferencing with students so that they are getting their mental health needs met um, and they are reaching out to those students who are in need and um, maybe they haven't been responsive um, but they are reaching out to our social workers to make those contacts to make sure that we are staying in contact with those kids and and making sure that we're providing them with the services for their needs so um, they are aware of those kinds of things um, and we also have provided um, our social workers today, our counselors, nurses today with some local and um, online resources for mental health and social emotional learning around not just, you know, things that they were already dealing with, but also around um, their own um, concerns around COVID-19. I know for the um, students who are identified under special education who do have, um, know have the deep mental health needs, our, um, <clears throat> our current behavior liaison has reached out to those students and is um, working with our, and our school psychologists are also partnering with Ms. Cobb and her group to um, continue to look at the social emotional learning and social emotional supports that are needed during this time. I love that. And I just love that this piece about keep people whole um, is one of the four priorities for our students and our staff as well, because this is um, intense stuff, um, I think, that everyone's dealing with. So thank you all. Thank you, Mrs. Smiley. Any other questions or comments? So uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Felton. No, you go right ahead. I just wanted to make a, a generic statement that I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Felder, for your unwavering leadership during this crisis. You know, all of the staff, administrator support, maintenance operations, nutrition, transportation, all of our teaching assistants, our teachers for engaging our students, our parents, the community during this uncertain time. And, you know, I, I'd also just like to thank the community for the generosity and supporting our, our students and families during this time. You know, also our legislators, you know, Greg Myers, Valerie Pushi, for their continued updates and support. Uh, Mayor Weaver and the town of Hillsborough as well um, have just, it's just been, you know, amazing, you know, everybody coming together. And, you know, Dr. Felder, you're at the top of making sure that we're doing all the right things and pulling this together. So I, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for all your efforts and, uh, you know, your continuing support on this. 
Uh, so uh, thank you uh, so much, Mr. Averton. Uh, I appreciate that, um, but I uh, have to say uh, that this is um, a team effort. Um, I think we could spend the next few hours, and don't worry, we won't. Um, <laughs> I can see pictures. <laughs> so I know you guys are getting tired, but um, could spend the next few hours just talking about the amazing work that has happened in this community. And um, this is not the work of the district alone. Uh, we are, this is truly an example of the village. You know, we, we, we say it all the time, it takes a village. Well, here's an opportunity for the village to be a village and take care of its children, take care of its families, take care of its staff. And it is playing out right before our eyes. And so, I uh, thank the board and um, I thank the staff for all of the work that they're doing. Um, teachers, principals, bus drivers, um, people are rolling up their sleeves and doing what needs to be done to ensure that our children have what they need and their families. And so uh, this is unprecedented time and it's unprecedented work. And um, I am most grateful to be part of this work. And so huge thank you to everyone. And so as we uh, wrap up this section, we have just a, a, a short little um, video to share with you all. And uh, so uh, Todd, this is it. <laughs> this is your cue, let her rip. Hey, that's the end of it. <laughs> Where's the beginning? And I don't think it has music, so it's just pictures and pictures speak a thousand words. So uh, <clears throat> hey, Will. Yes, Dr. H. Dr. Felder, those pictures speak more than a thousand words. It's more like a million. Thank you for your leadership. Thanks to everybody for what they're doing in this unprecedented time. And God bless you all. Can we put that on social media? I feel like people would love to see those pictures. It's so heartwarming and um, I just think it would be really nice to have out there if possible. Sure, we can do that. Thank you for the suggestion. Just one more item I want to share on this topic before we uh, before we leave this topic, um, um, and I'll forward this out to the board as well. Um, so, Representative Greg Meyer and uh, Ashton tomorrow night at p.m. Education Town Hall. So it's for uh, you know whether you're an educator, a public, or a board member. Uh, they'll be uh, listening for questions and giving answers as they're preparing for the General Assembly House COVID Educational Work Group. So a lot of focus on how legislation is going to help address um, the educational uh, issues uh, through this work group. But I'll forward it out, uh, the information on how to join. But it is a way for us to participate as well in their in their discussions and uh, get answers as well from you know state representative. 
Mr. Atherton, if I could for just a second, I'm going to forward to the board. I've been working with the uh, uh, legislation as well, and we've sent a request in um, for multiple different waivers uh, and um, exceptions to help from a legislative point of view. So I'll send that to the board so that you all can see what we've done on it. And I know it's a long night. I just, when you get a chance, I've sent you all um, a summary of the new law regarding changes to the leave provisions, FMLA and sick leave. They're connected to the coronavirus. So um, you all can look at that um, when time permits. I know your inboxes are probably uh, very full, but uh, wanted to mention that. Thank you. And if I could as well, just mention what an honor it has been to just even just to participate in this meeting. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, All right, anything else on this topic, Dr. Feldman? Again, thank you, everyone. All right. Um, but before we uh, get to the last item, which would be to adjourn, I'd just like to thank uh, you know, Todd Jones and team for getting us to an e-meeting, first ever. <laughs> you know, we did have some hiccups, but I think we've learned a lot to uh, be able to pull this together and, you know, conduct business. So I appreciate all the efforts uh, from uh, Todd Jones and also Jonathan, we appreciate you verifying and putting all the things in place that we knew what we needed to do to have an appropriate meeting. And board, I appreciate all your patience in getting us to here. Uh, you know, people may not realize we actually started this journey last week and, you know, trying every individual board member getting the software and getting used to it. So I just wanted to thank everybody and everybody that's on the meeting and the public uh, for uh, participating in our first meeting. And uh, we will get better as we uh, take our lessons learned moving forward. So with that, do we have a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Uh, opposed? Aye. Good night, everybody. Thank y'all. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Oops.